My life as an archaeologist began in a hole. Here I am a long time ago at the site of biblical Beersheba. How did I get there? I blame it on the friend who told me about a study travel program in Israel. That summer, I fell in love with archaeology, and the rest is history. Fast forward 30 years when I began to kill off former colleagues by writing mystery novels. In The Bootlegger's Nephew, my protagonist can't figure out whether his friend was poisoned deliberately or just consumed a mixture of bad booze, prescription medicine, and homemade tonics. His flapper daughter, Anna, helps him investigate, and together they trap a murderer and shut down a local gang of bootleggers. This story was supposed to be about 1920s archaeology when it was still just a gentleman's hobby, but the fascinating story of prohibition took over. Step back in time to the roaring 20s. Model T Fords or Tin Lizzie's are on the streets. You can visit buildings such as the Virginia Theater, the Posh Inman Hotel, or meet your friends for a soda at Freiner's. Near the train station, is where all the action is. There are many bars, but it's hard to buy a legal drink. That's because the country's silliest law, the Volstead Act passed in 1919, says you can consume or possess liquor, but you can't sell it or transport it. Drinking has increased and gone underground. Former saloons have morphed into speakeasies where you can buy booze if you go in the right door and give the password. Speakeasy means no shouting or noise that might attract the feds. Many speaks are rooms in private homes, often disguised by moving walls and hidden doors. The more elaborate speakeasies have added powder rooms to attract women. Blind pigs are watering holes hidden behind storefronts that look like laundries or florists. One customer enters the front to buy flowers, but those in the know go around to a separate door. If a raid does occur, you sneak out the back door. The second floor of Seven Saints used to be a speakeasy with an escape route into the next building. There was also an underground steam tunnel between Market and Walnut Streets, a convenient escape route. The speaks are crowded with young people living it up. Girls wear sleeveless, slinky dresses, powdered stockings, and makeup. Some wear unfashioned galoshes, good for hiding flasks of booze, and giving them the name flappers because the loose galoshes flap as they walk. Speaking of hiding booze, there are many forms of concealed carry. Many outfits are modified to create pockets. People are ingenious about transporting liquor in quantity using secret compartments in cars, false bottom trucks, and disguised containers. You can still buy high quality imported whiskey if you can afford it, but it's much easier and cheaper to get it diluted with raw alcohol and water. Never mind that it's colored with caramel or creosote and comes in a recycled bottle. Do you remember the first time Urbana went dry while champagne remained wet? The 1907 law forbidding public sale of booze passed first in Urbana, forcing drinkers to visit saloons in champagne while businessmen stockpiled booze to get through the dry spell. Here's what our newspaper wrote about a raid. There were bottles of liquor hidden inside boxing gloves and stuffed inside a phonograph. There was wood alcohol, Jamaican ginger, liquor made from kerosene and furniture polish, booze that would make a rabbit expectorate in a bulldog's face, squirrel whiskey that would make a man climb a tree. <laughs> One year champagne lost so much revenue from liquor licenses not being paid during a dry spell that the city had to lay off police and firemen and turn off every single street light for a month. During Prohibition, people got so desperate, they'd drink anything, mixing flavors with toxins like embalming fluid or kerosene. Some used lead-lined radiators in their stills and poisoned themselves and others. Bad booze could land you in the hospital or worse. Too much Jamaican ginger gave you muscle weakness and a severe limp, the dreaded Jake foot. 
bad booze could blind or kill you. If you were a shy female and didn't want to go out, you just stayed home and chugged a little Mrs. Pinkham's vegetable compound, about 20% alcohol. Even children were roped in. There was an enterprising family in Cincinnati who ran a speakeasy in their home. Their underage son dispensed liquor through tubes from the second floor. When there was a raid, he just threw a rug over the floor tubes and spread out his homework. How many ways can you say bad liquor in the 1920s? How about white lightning, coffin varnish, panther piss, tarantula juice, horse liniment, bust head, rot gut, or giga water? How many ways can you say drunk? My favorites are ossified and spifflicated, but there's also half seas over, squiffy, boiled as an owl, stiff, wall-eyed, stinko, and loaded to the muzzle. The expression, I've got to see someone about a dog, was code for I'm going out to buy some bootleg whiskey. My advice is, be careful what you drink or get your home brew from someone you trust. I trust my husband. He's a former chemist who used to make his own beer until it blew up. <laughs> then he became a pathologist. Should I be worried? What did he give me this time? Charlie, what on earth did you put in there? Thank you. <laughs>